Welcome back to Supreme Myths. Uh, my very special guest today is Chief Justice David Namius of the Georgia Supreme Court. Chief Justice Namius went to Duke and then Harvard Law School. He clerked for Judge Silberman on the Court of Appeals. He clerked for Justice Scalia. Um, he worked for, in private practice in D.C. and then at the Justice Department doing a a lot of stuff I don't understand about counterterrorism. Then he came back to Atlanta to be the U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Georgia, uh, and now he is the Chief Judge Justice of the Georgia Supreme Court. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate the invitation. It's always fun to talk to you. Yeah, we, uh, we have a good time together, even if we uh, agree in a civil fashion. Um, so I want to begin with it. Before we get to your job as Supreme Court Justice and the law, you were U.S. attorney here for a number of years. And the Northern District of Georgia is a pretty big place to be a U.S. attorney. Um, did you enjoy that job? What were the ups and downs? How hard was it? You know, I'm curious what you how you felt about it. Well, I've had some pretty interesting and, and uh nice experiences as a lawyer but actually i think being u.s attorney most u.s attorneys whatever they go on to will tell you was perhaps the funnest job and most interesting and rewarding job uh, i actually was an assistant u.s attorney in that in the northern district for about seven years um, and i think that is a, a wonderful job for um, lawyers generally um, particularly those who are interested in litigation the criminal law um, being U.S. attorney is even better because you get to take credit for the work that's done by all those assistant U.S. attorneys. <laughs> you get to set priorities. Um, I never felt bad about that because the U.S. attorneys who were there when I was an assistant took credit for a lot of my stuff, too. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, there's one big defect with being a U.S. attorney if you love the Department of Justice. It, it generally means that... Uh, whenever the president who appointed you leaves office, you're going to be leaving too. And so right. kind of when you accept that job, um, you know, your, your time in the justice department, um, is going to come to an end, but, uh, it's a great job. The Northern district of Georgia has developed a great reputation over the past, uh, 30 or 40 years. Um, a lot of the U S attorneys have gone on to other significant positions and assistant U.S. attorneys. Um, you know, Chris Ray is the head of the FBI. He was an assistant U.S. attorney in Atlanta. Sally Yates, Larry Thompson became deputy um, attorney generals. Um, I'm on this court. We've had a number of judges who go on to the uh, people who go to the federal bench. So um, it is it is a great job um, and was was uh, really rewarding what I say to a lot of young people interested in the law and criminal justice, I, you know, being a, a prosecutor, particularly a federal prosecutor, is one of the very few places lawyers have an ethical duty of doing the right thing. Right. Um, most lawyers' ethical duty is to zealously serve their clients, and there's that's how our system works. It's a critical function, but you know your clients don't always want you to do the right thing. They want you to do the thing that will help their side <laughs> prevail. And um, and even as a judge, at least if you're a judge of the sort, you know, I try to be, um, there are lots of times where prosecutors or trial judges have exercised discretion in a way that you don't really like. Um, but, you know, if it's within their discretion, you, you have to affirm it. So even the range of your ethical duty as a judge is to follow the law, which is not always to do justice. Um, you, you know, and so it's really, it's really a rewarding job, I think, for the people um, who get to serve as prosecutors. And the other thing I tell, particularly young lawyers who are interested in um, criminal defense, because they want to protect innocent people and people who are often um, victimized um, in the criminal justice system, is. You know, you can do that on the criminal defense side, and criminal defense lawyers are critical and do great work, you know, but one of the dream things for a criminal defense lawyer is getting your innocent client acquitted at trial. By then, that's a good result if your client was innocent, but their life is, is usually ruined by that point. They've been charged. They've often right. been detained for years. You know, if, if you're a good prosecutor, you can make those decisions on the front end. You right. can decide that somebody's not guilty you can press investigators to 
you know, is this really evidence that I can prove beyond a reasonable doubt? Um, and so a lot of, you know, the best that can be done in our criminal justice system is on the prosecution side for the benefit of criminal defendants if you have good prosecutors who understand their duty. You know, I worked for the Department of Justice for the first George Bush, and interestingly, and this is before I came back to Georgia State to teach, and uh, I got lucky and got involved in several high-profile cases, but what everybody said up there was there were certain U.S. attorney's offices that were special. Of course, the Southern District of New York famously has its own, you know, turf, but Los Angeles and Atlanta were the two other places where if there were big yeah. cases, DOJ would say, you know what, we can, we can trust the U.S. attorneys there. That wasn't really true for a lot of other big city U.S. attorneys. I, I don't think right. Chicago had a good relationship with, with DOJ. But everyone always talked incredibly highly of the Northern District of Georgia. And when I clerked for Judge Moy at the Northern District of Georgia a long time ago, he would always tell me that he thought the lawyers at the U.S. Attorney's Office and the federal public defenders in Atlanta, both, were some of the most excellent lawyers he had ever seen. I think that's a really nice reflection in our city. Yes? It is, and, and uh, you know, and I think there's a real pride in the office, as there is in the Justice Department generally, but, um, but we hopefully will continue that. We've got a, a current assistant U.S. attorney who's just been nominated to be the new U.S. attorney, and um, I know the office always likes that because they know somebody who's been imbued with the culture there right. is going to continue it. Um, and also, I, f I forgot you work for the um, George Bush administration, which is also a good indication of the fact that the Justice Department should be a nonpartisan um, institution. And, you know, the leadership has policies that are set by the president or by the attorney general, but, and, and U.S. attorneys have a range of policy choices about what to focus on and devote resources to, but it should never be an institution that, um, you know, has political motives. We, we agree on that. And, and actually, you raised something interesting. Um, when I was at DOJ, we had several cases involving something called CHAMPUS, which is kind of the, the health insurance for the armed forces. And some policy decisions were made that were at the least controversial, at the most, I thought, inhumane. Um, and that triggered a debate whether we would actually defend this particular agency decision. They were my client. Um, and that led to a bigger debate, and I'm very curious about your opinion on this. Um, it was my position that as a lawyer for the Department of Justice, my client, although technically the agency, was really the American people, and that we have a different obligation to our client than a normal lawyer has to their client. Not everybody agreed with that. I will say the Bush administration I worked for was terrific when I pointed out that this particular new policy was both probably illegal and in any event immoral, we didn't have to defend it. They went to the agency and said, sorry, we're not going to do this for you. And I was really happy about that. But some people did say I was wrong, that our client, the agency, it's the same relationship as a lawyer would have to a private client. What do you think about that? I, I, I think the, um, the client of the Department of Justice is the United States. Me not, too. <laughs> which is the people of the United States. I mean, it's it's actually in some ways trickier on the civil side of mm -hmm. Maine D DOJ and uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office, and frankly, even uh, in state government with the Attorney General's, the Department of Law, um, because you often in civil cases do have kind of institutional um, clients within the government. And and so you have to balance their interests and needs um, but ultimately, your client, it, it, and it's, you know, it's not that different than being a, a lawyer for a corporation who has to remember that the client is a corporation and not the CEO or, right. you know, or particular employees of the corporation. So that's an, often an interesting dilemma for lawyers who have to keep straight who their client is. And as I often tell young lawyers, you know, one of the, maybe the most important thing lawyers have to do is be willing to tell people no. Um, right. I tell I tell my interns it's good training. You know they need to tell me if they think I'm getting something wrong um, because that's why I need them. Um, <laughs> and uh, 
but that's good training because whether you're a, a you have private clients or you have corporate clients or governmental agency clients that's the hardest thing for lawyers to do um, it's easy to tell your client oh sure you know we'll go do that it's hard to tell your client especially if your client is powerful or rich or uh, influential to tell your client you know that you can't do that under the law right um, so and I mean this in a completely nonpartisan way. I think actually that Bush administration, Department of Justice, back in 1988, 99, 90, may have been the last one to view what we both agree on as the client being the American people, not necessarily what the government wants to do. And that includes Clinton and Obama, as well as Trump and the second George Bush. And I, I, I think yeah. I think something at OLC changed. We'll get into that. that we don't have to get into that. But I, I, yeah. I like to think, you know, that DOJ thinks their client is the American people. I, well, I, I don't, I think, I think the vast majority of people in the Department of Justice have had that view. It's certainly in the culture in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Atlanta, yeah. and which is a good thing. Yeah. And, um, you know, and it is a very important part of the proper culture <laughs> of the Department of Justice or of, of any uh, yeah. office that has to defend the government. So you spent a lot of your career in federal court, obviously, um, uh, and then you became a, a, a justice of the Georgia Supreme Court and now the, the chief justice. Um, are there major differences between litigating in state? I mean, I assume there are major differences. Let, let's take the criminal side first, because that's, I think, what, what are some of the major differences? You know, the biggest difference is uh, caseload and resources. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the federal courts have, um, you know, are are busy. They feel busy when you're there. But when <laughs> you look at the numbers, you know, they they handle, you know, to be pretty blunt about it, a trivial part of the overall litigation in, in this country. Um, somewhere, you know, in the neighborhood of, of less than 5%, it may be like less than 3% of the criminal cases and an even smaller proportion of the civil cases, although some of that is blown up by the fact that, you know, things like uh, family law and collections and uh, uh, evictions go to almost entirely to state courts, and there right. are huge numbers of those matters. But, um, you know, a huge number of cases are going to the state courts, and the resources devoted, you know, are not proportional to that um, so, you know, the federal courts obviously have very important cases, both on the criminal and the civil side, uh, on the criminal side, you know, the U S attorney's offices, there are some things that they really only can do, um, particularly things, and it grows more and more with, um, cross border, both state borders, jurisdictional borders within a state like Georgia with 159 counties can be very difficult to coordinate um, criminals who move, you know, right. you can move from county to county and not go very far in Georgia um, and create venue issues where the U.S. Attorney's Office can prosecute them as a single crime. And then transnational crime, which is growing. Um, public corruption, which can be complicated to deal with at the local or state level. Um, so there are certain things that, that the federal courts um, and federal prosecutors need to do but we should realize, you know, when we had difficult, close cases, um, we often say, would say, okay, well, the DA can handle that. Right. Um, and so those are, the DAs have, you know, a, an awful lot of, of cases to handle um, and often not the kind of resources you get when you have not only the, the federal court structure and the resources of, of prosecutors, but also the investigative resources of the FBI and ATF and uh, uh, DEA. So, so that's a big difference, um, you know. And I, I had not worked much with the state courts. I've been impressed by, you know, the overall level of of quality of the state courts in, in handling this enormous number of cases. It varies some. We have we have a giant state with a, a whole lot of uh, courts and a whole lot of judges, but you know, overall, um, given the challenges they have, I think they do an excellent job. Um, 
I want to compare what you do to what the United States Supreme Court does. You once yeah. told me, and I forget the exact number, about how many opinions do you write a year? So our court writes somewhere between 300 and 350 published opinions a year compared to the U.S. Supreme Court, which putting aside last year for both courts with COVID, well, actually, we still wrote about 348 wow. opinions last year. You know, the U.S. Supreme Court does 70 or 80 a year. So yeah. I think no justice has written more than 10 majority opinions in several years. Um, you know, I typically write about 30 to 40 majority opinions a year. Wow. wow. Um, until 2016, our court had seven justices. So, you know, we wrote more in the neighborhood of 45 majority opinions a year. Um, That's crazy. And we used to do it with two staff attorneys Again, the last few years we've had three, but the U.S. Supreme Court typically has four or five um, clerks. So, um, it, you know, our nem we don't our cases are not always as complicated or difficult as the ones they pick, um, but we produce an awful lot of, of output with less help. I think you work a rest. lot harder with a lot less help. I I'll also say, um, over the last few years, I've been kind of paying attention. I, I know I understand a lot of your cases are a lot of the Supreme Court cases also aren't they're nine nothing fairly easy cases no one cares about and and the Georgia Supreme Court has issued some really major important decisions over the years I go back a long time now to when uh, after Bowers versus Hardwick was decided at the Supreme Court against the idea of well, upholding a Georgia law prohibiting same-sex sodomy um, the Georgia Supreme Court reversed that before the Supreme Court did um, and I think there are other examples of that as well. Yeah, I mean, that was an example um, from a, a few years ago. You know, we have, we've had a resurgence um, in our court, as well as I think a lot of other state Supreme Courts in recognizing that our state constitution is not the same as the federal constitution, right. Um, right. which should be something pretty obvious, but, um, you know, and it's not exactly clear why, but but kind of the 70s and 80s and into um, into this uh, century, you know, state courts. It may have been that they were kind of overwhelmed by all the the kind of late Warren Court opinions um, extending federal rights, especially in the criminal arena, to the states that they just started responding by acting as if whatever the U.S. Supreme Court said was the same as the state constitution, even though state constitutions predate the federal constitution. Right. The Georgia, the most recent Georgia constitution, and we've had 10 constitutions as opposed to one federal constitution, <laughs> is 1983, which is, you know, very modern history. And, um, and so our court has been focusing more on what uh, our constitution means, which is not the same in right. all cases as a federal constitution and that that's important um we hope lawyers are paying attention to that we we can't do it when the issues aren't raised um and well briefed but uh it's really an important area judge jeff sutton of the sixth circuit has written a, a couple books in this area and and it really is an emerging area um as state courts realize um, the importance of interpreting their own constitutions. And when you say emerging, uh, I, I, you may find this interesting. I have a student who's doing a law review note, as we speak, on originalism in state courts. And the most, in, well, the, the most interesting thing about this project, and it makes it very challenging for a student, there's almost nothing written on this. Uh, a political science professor at Georgia State has recently written a book on, on state courts. But overall, if you, want, if, you, if you Google originalism and anything else, you get a zillion entries. But right. if you do originalism state courts, it's an underserved area of scholarship. It, it is. I think the word originalism will be underserved. I know you can go back in my court's history and find quotations from, you know, as early as we were formed in 1846, we're celebrating our 175th anniversary, wow. actually a program in a couple of weeks. Um, but in our first couple of years, we had statements and opinions and as late as kind of the forties and fifties that, you know, if, if you took them, if you took them out of, uh, of where they were and, and read them, people would think they were 
you know, Justice Scalia or Justice <laughs> Gorsuch talking about originalism. They just didn't have that label. But, you know, our court said things unanimously for generations and generations, like, you know, the, the Constitution has to be interpreted um, based on the understanding that the framers and the people who ratified it had at the time. Um, it's not a fluid document that's meaning can change over time. And I think there's something along the lines of, you know, that would be a fraud upon the people who enacted it. <laughs> so you clerked for Justice Scalia. So let's get into originalism and textualism a little bit. We've been friendly so far. We'll stay friendly. Um, yeah. but, but I would respectfully ask time to respond to whatever it is you're going to say about this. Um, here's my very specific question about originalism, though, before. Um, so... When I grew up, uh, when I, I came, I, I was a teacher in 1991, my first year at Georgia State. If you freeze that year and you read originalists and Bork, Berger, um, whoever was writing at the time in originalism, we're all Berger I'm talking about, not Justice Berger. Um, a key part of originalism, and I think the early Scalia did this too, was deference. In other words, a plaintiff comes to court and says the federal government or state government is doing something to me that violates the Constitution. And the early originalists would say, all right, give us clear and convincing evidence this violates the text, which it almost never does, or the original meaning of the Constitution. If you don't do that, you lose. And it was a heavy burden of proof. That's circa 1991. That is not originalism circa 2021 to most academics. Um, I can name them Randy Barnett, Ilya Soman, we go on and on and on on this. Um, so I'm curious, A, if where you are on that spectrum, and B, why you think that changed. Um, well, I mean, I'll say the whole, you know, the interpretation and, and doctrine has changed on the scholarly side a fair amount as people have studied. Um, you know, as, as we've discussed in other settings, yeah. um, I tend to be of the same view and, you know, Justice Scalia, at least in some of his comments and writings was of the same view that, you know, the constitution is meant to take certain things out of the democratic process, but really only the things that it says it's taking out or that right. there is a very well-established tradition in history of taking out at the time they were supposedly taken out of the democratic realm and everything else is left to the legislature either the national legislature or if, you know, you actually apply federalism as well to the state legislatures. Um, and, you know, interestingly, um, Jeff Sutton has a book coming out, and I think it may have come out in the last couple of weeks, um, that focuses on the structural side of state constitutional law compared to the federal side and does a fair amount of analysis of originalism or judicial review in the early state constitutional setting, which like many things, you know, we all are taught Marbury versus Madison in law school, but um, you know, there are some cases that look pretty clear that the US Supreme Court applied judicial review before Marbury and state courts did it all over the place um, before Marbury. Um, so it wasn't kind of, you know, John Marshall suddenly, you know, this is, <laughs> This is a thing that dropped out of nowhere. Um, but when they did it, not only before Marbury, but in the, the decades after Marbury, you know, they were much more along with the lines of what you were talking about. They were, it, it was, it's almost a doctrine of like preemption, which is more like what it was on the common law side where you had, you know, levels of law, local laws, common law, and then statutes. And you know, you decide those issues based on where there's clearly something of superior um, source that trumps the law that's at a inferior side. And so, uh, you know, a lot of the words you see in some of our court's cases, like a, you know, a law is presumed constitutional and the conflict with whatever constitutional provision has to be plain and palpable, you know, those right. are words you see in cases from the 1700s and 1800s in state courts and in the federal courts. Justice Thomas, Just if I may, yeah. I, the opening chapter of my book talks about those state cases and the overwhelming consensus among 
the state court judges who were wrestling now with the federal constitution, both right. state state charters, and was we do have the power to say a law is inconsistent with it, but right. we're going to exercise that power almost never with great humility as a last resort and only upon an, a showing of clear error. That was the language. And, and I think Alexander Hamilton adopted that language in the Federalist Papers. Right. And I, I think there's, you know, I, I think there are very strong arguments for that um, approach. Uh, you know, you, you can go too far. I mean, you, you can take deference to the point that, you know, rights that are very well established um, and, and some of the kind of progressive legal realist judges in the early part of the 20th century, particularly, you know, arguably went too far the other way of allowing things um, that had very deep kind of roots in the common law and or in uh, tradition. But uh, and so you you need to enforce the rights that are in the Constitution or you kind of render them uh, that whole idea that some things are taken out of the democratic process. But but my own view is is uh, along those lines that you know judicial review is meant to be a limited power. Um, one of the very interesting concepts that Judge Sutton has brought out that I'm particularly kind of had never thought of it this way is is the idea of judicial review as kind of gerrymandering. We all we all don't really like this idea that legislators get to pick the people who vote. Right. As a matter of policy, that's very broadly held. You know, as a matter sure. of law, how that's supposed to be regulated, I'm not going to comment on the U.S. Supreme Court had a divided opinion about whether there's judicial review of that issue. Right. But but as a matter of policy, most Americans don't like the idea that legislators get to pick kind of the realm of their voters. Well, you can think of judicial review of every time judges say, like, this is a topic that we get to control. Um you know, whether it's, you know, abortion, death penalty, um, whatever, um, any, any of those areas, ju judges are basically t saying we are deciding, you know, our vote, our realm of authority. And, you know, and that's a, it makes you think about it again in terms of, well, you should be pretty cautious about that. Um, because, you know, one of the problems with constitutionalizing things is, it tends, especially at the federal level, it locks them in. And so, you know, if, if you constitutionalize something, you are taking it out of the democratic process. And maybe that's, you know, that may seem like the best policy idea at a point in time, but the reality is the world changes and, and maybe two generations later, you look back and say, well, we'd like to adjust that. But now our choices are we got to convince judges to adjust it and overcome stare decisis or tinker with it. So, so I, you know, I, we've talked before. I, I tend to agree. You know, you should be cautious. I don't know that that's a critique of originalism because. Um, no, I don't think it is. Know, the, I don't think yeah, it is the, a critique. I mean, the issue is kind of which rights are clear enough in right. the Constitution or which things are clear enough. And frankly, I, I think originalism tends to rein those in um, and textualism more than other theories. Um, you might disagree on that. Point. Well, that's the point. So this has been a love fest right. so far, which is nice. But we're yeah. about to, I think, fall out of love a little bit. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you a couple of hard questions about, about that point you just made. Um, my first one is this. Justice Scalia voted in his career to strike down, depending how you count, somewhere between 135 and 145 laws. That's a lot of laws. <laughs> and it's my position that in most of those cases, he either did not even try to make an originalist showing or could not make an originalist showing. I'll just give one example. We don't, we don't talk about my example, but there are a lot of cases like this. In Prince versus United States, he says Congress can't commandeer state legislatures uh, to do what Congress wants to do, even when Congress is acting under the Commerce Clause in a legitimate way. There's not a text, there's not a syllable in the Constitution about that, and the history, frankly, goes the other way. That's one example, I think, of Scalia striking down a federal law where it was not clear, the error was not obvious. Um, he did that 145 times. Do you have any thoughts about that? <laughs> I mean, I haven't looked through all the cases. Yeah. Yeah. I, 
you know, the, I know you often make the argument that even judges who said they were originalists don't always kind of insist upon originalist reasoning in every opinion they join. Um, yeah. And that's certainly the case. You know, the reality is that would require you to write a whole lot of opinions that take a whole lot of work, um, which is not always it possible. Um, if the result you think is is the right result, um, you also you know the, one of the hardest questions for textualists and originalist judges in particular is stare decisis. And so, sure. you know, how much do you go along with the law as it exists, even if it is not what you think is textually or originally supported? So. You know, I don't know how many of those cases are, for example, First Amendment cases that were right. struck down. You know, there are pretty good arguments that a lot of First Amendment doctrine um, is not very well founded from a textualist or originalist standpoint. Um, there are, you know, most of those doctrines are pretty strongly supported by most people um, who don't like textualism and originalism. <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, I guess you could criticize them as, you know, there are a lot of laws struck down under the First Amendment um, to say that, you know, oh, Scalia should have applied a textualist originalist standpoint and not struck them down. You know, some of that would re depend on stare decisis and some of it, um, I think people like, you know, you and a lot of the folks you like on your side of the <laughs> academic spectrum would jump up and down and say, that's outrageous that those laws were not struck down. So I, I, you, you took the words right out of you, actually. You, you took the words right out of my mouth, literally, because yeah. my next literally, because my next question was going to be, and I'm not even sure how I think about this. I've done a lot of reading actually and work on the original meaning of the First Amendment. And and just yesterday, by the way, just yesterday I saw a story that the New York Times was slapped with a prior restraint. I, I don't, I haven't, re yeah, no. I haven't researched the facts, but, but they did. They, they were absolutely told you cannot publish this anymore. Um, my reading of the history, and I've done a lot of it, is the original meaning of the First Amendment was to stop prior restraints. We all agree on that. The printing press came out in England, you know, Parliament and the right. King said, you can't publish things until you check with us. I, I'm absolutely con certain they did not want prior restraints. But punishment after the fact is a judicially created doctrine that didn't begin in 1850 or 1830 or not. It began in 19, really 1960s. I mean, to great, I mean, it started in the 1920s, but it really didn't go into effect into the 1960s, which to me, and I'm asking you this now as a judge, raises an interesting question. When we know that there's a lot of precedent out there, both, by the way, both of us probably like, you know, the flag burning case, we probably agree. I don't know if you do or not. But we probably agree if, if you're banning flag burning because of the message it's sending, that's kind of a no-no because it's political speech. But whatever the issue is, it's all judge-made and all in the last 70 years. Should we reconsider it? Well, I mean, that gets into the issues of stare decisis. My, my court can't reconsider the First Amendment doctrine. <laughs> um, you know, we, we recently, I just recently wrote an opinion that relied on New York Times v. Sullivan. And, right. you know, there are, there are certainly some pretty good Justice Thomas and Justice Gorsuch have said, you know, that there are real questions about how that aligns with the original understanding. Um, Justice White, who wasn't an originalist across the board, had a lot of critiques of, of that, particularly as it expanded past public officials to public figures. But, um, you know, your point, the, the Georgia Constitution doesn't just say, you know, Congress shall not abridge the freedom of speech. It says no law shall be passed to curtail or restrain the freedom of speech or the press. But then it says every person may speak, write, and publish sentiments on all subjects, but shall be responsible for abuse of that liberty. Right. And that provision is pre-First Amendment. I think it was taken from the Massachusetts yeah. um, Constitution. So, yeah. so your point, I think, is a good one. You know, you run into stare decisis. You run into the fact that there is very much imbued in our culture and understanding of the First Amendment that it is a very generalized protection of freedom to say anything you want. You know, it's often extended. Your kids have probably said at some point, you know, I can say that it's my First Amendment right, right and you right. try to explain the state action doctrine. Only once a them. day, Your Honor. Only once a day yeah. I say that. So, you know, it, 
that's pretty deeply embedded in our culture. Um, but, but, you know, reconsidering that raises all the kind of reliance and, and embeddedness issues, at least at the federal level. You know, the other point on some of the criticism of Justice Scalia that I think, it, or originalist judges generally, that I think is very fair is they may get it wrong. Um, right. Their understanding of, of you know, the, the doctrine, and it's particularly hard with the U.S. Constitution because it's so old, you know, they, they may not get it right without help from legal historians and um, other historians and good briefing by the lawyers. And I think particularly in the early, his early years on the bench, um, and I know this has been true with the Georgia Constitution in, in my first years, you know, it is very hard work to do. Um, and, and if you don't have help, you may not get it right. Um, and then you might have to reconsider it except for the problem of at that point you have to deal with star decisis but yeah we um but i i think justice scalia would say that's a very fair criticism that you know and i would say that you know that we got the history wrong and if it's pointed out that we you know we got the history wrong and there are other cases out there or other doctrines or sources you know if you're being honest about it you should consider correcting I want to move on to statutory interpretation in a minute, but one more observation about this. And I think, you know, you and I come from very different places. My intuition is we're going to agree on this. I may be wrong. A big part of the judicial review debate for me is that I look at it as five, six, seven, eight, or nine lawyers, judges, in Washington, D.C., in federalism cases, telling 50 states what they can and cannot do. And I view that as offensive, absent clear error. If a state, you know, does something the Constitution clearly forbids, fine. We agree on that. That's pretty rare. And when, so, so I'm, as you know, I'm pro-choice all the way down. Um, I'm not asking you your opinion on that. But I think Roe was wrong. Um, I am slightly in favor of affirmative action. I go back and forth. But I think strict scrutiny is wrong for affirmative action. I think w if New York wants to experiment with it, it should. Um, and on guns which is, to me, the most local issue of all. What works in Montana doesn't work in New York City, and what works in Atlanta doesn't work in Savannah. And I think that, I had Eugene Volokh on this week, and I asked him this question. I said, why is it that we lose federalism in individual rights cases? Like, we don't think about it, individual rights cases involving states as federalism, but they are. And, and I wish the Supreme Court would pay more attention to that. Do you agree with that? He, he said I, I no, by the way. He disagreed. No, I, I actually, I do tend to agree with it. I think, um, you know, and Judge Sutton writes about this at, at some length, that um, because the Supreme Court, when they do kind of recognize a right, or it is a right that is universal across a continent. Right. And, you know, it's a right that's the same in New York City as it is in rural Montana. Right. You know they they should be first they should be aware of that and and frankly sometimes they seem aware of that and they might under protect rights um for that reason but but they also can can you know issue a ruling that doesn't really you know reflect the history or tradition of the entire united states um and that is something that should be kept in mind and should be a caution less of a caution to state courts because you know at the state level um you have usually a better understanding of your state tradition and history your constitution is usually um you know has more specific sources that are particular to your state and that constitution so you're not relying on you know what did the first amendment mean we'll go look at a bunch of state constitutions or the law in this colony or that colony right um and then one other big big thing is state constitutions are almost universally much easier to amend yes. than federal constitutions. So, you know, it almost every state has a process where only 50% of the legislature or the voters um, are needed to amend the constitution. So if a state court does get it wrong, the there's a way to, to you know, democratically correct it. Still lots of, of barriers, but it's you know, compared to very few federal amendments over two centuries, two and a half centuries. So, so I think that's a very good point and, and 
uh, and should be in the mind of of judges. Um, I don't know that it's you know dramatically different the way you should interpret constitutions. I think you should be cautious about striking laws down <laughs> generally, but federally that that is a, a good argument for being even more cautious. And I will tell you that from Eugene Volokh on the right <laughs> to um, you know uh, Erwin Chemerinsky on the left and everybody in between in my world, in my constitutional law world, the argument I just made to you that we should consider individual right cases, rights cases that affect all 50 states with an eye towards federalism is ignored, um, not by Judge Sutton, but by almost all the legal scholars it is ignored. And I was yeah. surprised by Eugene's reaction to this yesterday. I was. Um, and, and they just don't accept it. And, I don't, and I'm, I'm like a lone person screaming in the wilderness on this issue. And it makes me well, mad. I, I will say, you know, one of the things that I think, well, the, another very interesting area, and there have been a couple of dissents from uh, certiorari uh, rulings, I think by Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas is, you know, the Supreme Court seems to have a lot more um, comfort with federal, lower federal courts that strike down state laws as unconstitutional as yes. opposed to federal laws as unconstitutional. Yes. When the lower courts strike down federal laws, you know, the Supreme Court routinely grants cert to review that because it's seen as a big deal. Whereas, you know, federal courts strike down state courts all the time. <laughs> um, I mean, state laws all the time is unconstitutional. And, you know, I don't know how much of that is we don't want to have to take all those cases and do the work or, and how much of it is we just don't think it's a big deal that, you know, a federal, a federal district court struck down a major state law as, as violative of the federal constitution you know, that doesn't seem to be as much of a big deal um, yeah. to the U.S. Supreme Court. But for the reasons you just said, I don't know why why that should be. Um, it it but, would help if they uh, took a few more cases, but we'll, that's a different issue. Yeah. Some of this, I think, though, you know, the state law issue goes back to race and sure. the fact that, you know, a lot of states had, had including Georgia, had a lot of laws that were, um, you know, laws and, and ordinances and all kinds of other legal principles that were, you know, plainly violative of what we now understand to be um, what is right and moral and good. And, you know, the U.S. Supreme Court, um, after a long hiatus from the area, you know, came in and, and started trying to fix those systems. And, um, and so got in the habit of striking down lots of state laws and letting lower courts strike down lots of state laws. And, you know, and that, I think, habit kind of has persisted. You know, Justice Namis, I, I want to um, certainly Brown had a huge symbolic effect. We all agree on that. And it was a hugely important decision. Um, but I have to tell you, and this uh, my my reading of the history of the South in the 1950s and 60s and, and even early 70s, lower federal court judges did all the hard work, not the Supreme Court. It was Judge Tuttle and Judge Wisdom and, and Judge Johnson um, whose houses were you know, threatened to be bombed and whose families were threatened because they're the ones who were implementing Brown, not the Supreme Court of the United States, which is one of the bones I often pick with the Supreme Court. Um, I, I really think that's True, but we don't have to. You don't have to go there yeah. if you don't want. But th those are those those lower court judges I mentioned, wherever one falls, were true American heroes. Their personal lives were threatened on a regular basis. I, I would completely agree. Um, I just have seen some writing about Judge Joe Flat, who just yeah. has taken yeah. senior status. Um, you know who who did that in Jacksonville when he yep. first came on the the bench. Um, yep. And I'll point out, you know, I think a lot of those judges did the heavy lifting. Um, there were also a number of federal district court judges who were cowards and yes. um, and didn't do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, and that is one of the hardest things about being a judge. And it's even harder if you're on the state court side and you face election or you face right. living in a small community. Um, you know, to to say that's what the rule of law requires when right. it is very unpopular. I, I think you made an excellent point. That, that a lot of constitutional law scholars don't focus on, which is a lot of our aggressive judicial review today 
grows out of the needed and I think appropriate judicial review of race discriminatory laws in the 50s and 60s, I think, I think we know why the 14th Amendment was passed. And it was, you know, generally to make sure the newly freed slaves had equal rights. We can def- debate political rights versus civil rights, but that was the general idea of that. Um, we've taken that level of review and put it in a lot of places I think you and I might agree it does not necessarily belong. All right, let's talk about statutory interpretation. You and I had a nice um, discussion a few weeks ago here at Georgia State. I do want to say also, just with people listening, you have been a huge friend to my law school, and, and I can't tell you how much we appreciate that. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a huge, um, you deal with our students all the time, and you come and talk to us all the time. I appreciate that very much, and so does my law school. Um, you and I have a disagreement about statutory interpretation. So go ahead and describe your method, and I'll respond. How's that? <laughs> I mean, my method is really not any different than it is with any legal text, whether it's a contract or a will or a constitution. And you, it is a reading of the text in light of its ordinary English meaning, unless there are cues that tell you it's got a specialized meaning, like a definition and, or a common law history. Um, and it's read at the time it was drafted because that's when legal documents are formed. Um, that's not always an easy process, but uh, but I think that is the uh, I think that is a traditional process. It is the process that best accords with um, democratic government. And I also think that you know when we put aside constitutions, it's pretty much the way we naturally do almost every legal document. Um, that we ever encounter as lawyers and judges. Um, so I'm not sh- so uh, in addition to the discussion you and I had with Judge Dillard a few weeks ago here, I also went out to um, uh, Austin, Texas last week with a, a professor named Steve Lebin, who used to be a judge in, in Kansas City for a long time, um, t- in a room full of judges to talk about this issue. And one of the things that I mentioned was that both Blackstone not a terrible authority, and Chief Justice John Marshall uh, in a case called U.S. versus Fisher very early on in our history, both said that where, where the words are clear, we apply the, the words, and we agree on that. That's not hard. Where there is imprecision or uncertainty about what the words mean, they both effectively said judges should look at everything that's relevant to figuring out the common usage of that term. And don't fence out anything. Just, you know, it may not be relevant to this case or that case. But in general, whatever is relevant should be used where there's imprecision, which I don't think is what you're saying, unless I'm reading you wrong. Uh, I, I mean, I think that is what I'm saying. Okay. If, I mean, part of the question is what is relevant. Yes. Um, and, you know, but there are lots of cases of imprecision. Um, there's also the opposite view. There's often... There are a lot of cases where, you know, if you just look at the three words that one party or the other focuses on, or one word, you can look that word up in the dictionary and say, aha, that's the end of it. But if you look at it even in a little bit of context, or maybe a broader context, or you have to read a bunch of other statutes around it, I had an early case about the meaning of a term in the workers' compensation law, and our Court of Appeals in Georgia split 6-6 on how it applied by looking at the, like, three words at issue. Um, And then we were unanimous in in saying, well, part of it is it's in the workers' compensation statute. It was about suing a co-employee. And... (laughs) And the whole workers' compensation statute is about things that happen to you in the course of your work. <laughs> and so if it's if this was something that happened to an employee, a co-employee who wasn't in the course of their duties. And, you know, when you look at it in the sense of what is the what is the whole statute we're interpreting, those that one line you could pluck out that seemed very broad lost its broad meaning. So so that you certainly can look broader and narrower, you know, that there are certain things that people want to point to that you should look at, um, like, you know, consequences of an interpretation. And there are also certain things that people want you to look at, like the individual views of legislators. And, you know, I, you can say whether they're completely irrelevant or their relevancy approaches zero. Um, but, but it's certainly not 
you know, just read the words, look them up in a dictionary, and you're done. And in defense of Scalia, Gorsuch at all, they all yeah. reject literalism. And that's a, right. that's a straw man the left uses sometimes. I don't use that straw man. But so I, I have a piece coming. Well, this we're talking on Friday. Um, this is going to be public sometime next week before Thanksgiving. Um, but I have a piece coming out on Monday, and I'm curious what you think. So ha having really done deep dives into this for the last month or so, um, I think a lot of the debate between so-called textualists and so-called non-textualists or purposes or whatever you want to call them is actually an unnecessary well, that's, that's i'll say you know it's always interesting what do you call them because when they're non-textualists they often don't want to actually explain what their alternative view is because it immediately falls subject to almost all the exact same attacks you can make on textualism plus about a, a bunch more so but anyway, well, so I was reading this this fascinating Yates, and we talked about it at the judges conference in, in Texas. Yates versus United States. Really quickly for the listeners, um, a federal law prohibited. You know, um, it was basically passed in the wake of the two thousand eight economic crisis, um, and it said you can't destroy records, objects. Some, the question was, was a fish an object under the statute? Um, a guy on a boat was told by federal authorities, "Don't throw, keep those fish there." He had too many fish for federal law. He threw them overboard, um, and the majority in dissent, and it was and it was bipartisan. It was different, you know. It was not your typical five-four conservative liberal split. They they talk so much about canons of interpretation and and all kinds of interpretation tools. But Justice Namius, at the end of the day, the majority said we can't find this guy guilty because this statute was designed mostly or almost entirely for financial crime. Justice Kagan in dissent said, no, that's not true. This statute applies to all federal investigations, financial or not. I know this was an investigation about too many flounder on a boat. It, it, it's under the terms of the statute. But the real debate was not over canons of interpretation. The real debate was over the purpose of the law, either narrow economic crimes or broader all federal investigations. And I think that happens all the time that debates over text are really debates over purpose. Well, I, I, I mean, Justice Scalia and I and others, I mean, laws do have a purpose and purposes. The question is, where do you get that purpose from? <laughs> right. And, you know, the, so you, you get it from the terms, I mean, under the Constitution, something only becomes a law if it was written down, enacted by both houses and almost always signed by the chief executive. Right. Um, the Georgia Constitution makes that even clearer because it it talks, for example, about, you know, the journal of the the House and Senate have to record the laws. So the <laughs> idea that anything that's not written down is a law um, is, is fairly clear. But laws have purposes. I mean, and we often talk about the purpose of the law you know the the quest and and so you can get into a debate you look at at the you can look at the history against which a law was enacted and that often will tell you a lot about what the words mean um that sometimes when you started to talk about blackstone i thought you were going to talk about you know the mischief rule the old right. law the evil the new law and and that's kind of the idea i think a lot of that there is what was the law before and and then you have this new law it had to mean something. I mean, the words had a meaning. You know, the, the question is, if you say, well, the purpose of the law, if you take it up to a high level of generality, the, you know, the purpose of the law is, you know, to uh, protect the public. Um, right. Which we, you know, we're releasing a case, you know, where an argument was made like that. You know, the purpose of the law is to protect the public. So I'm going to interpret all the words you know, in the way to protect the public. Well, that's at such a high level of generality, you can kind of come up with any conclusion you want to. Um, or the other thing is to say, well, I know the purpose of the law because this one legislator, maybe the sponsor of the bill, you know, spoke up at at some place where none of the other, other legislators were there. We don't have any reason to think they knew what this person said. Certainly the president or the governor didn't have a clue what this person said he thought the purpose of the right. law was right but you know but based on this very helpful statement by one person or maybe it's even a committee report about the purpose of the law you know that's the end of the game 
And, you know, that was the legislative history. You know, you, you could find cases in, in the early 80s in the U.S. Supreme Court where that's how opinions would start. You can find cases in my court that that's how opinions start. The purpose of this law is this broad thing, see some statement a legislator made, and then three pages later you get to, and that accords with the text. <laughs> you know, that's the, the backward way at best to do it. But, but I think, you know, Yates is a good example of none of this is easy. I mean, it, well, I, I won't say that. It's often very easy. Um, you know, in a huge number of cases, it, it, interpreting legal documents is pretty easy. That's why people don't even go to hire lawyers to interpret their documents for them. They know what their right. contract or deed or the criminal law says. Or they hire a lawyer and their lawyer tells them what it is. And if it's in a dispute, the lawyer says you're either going to win or lose because it's pretty clear. And when they go to court, you know, it's often pretty clearly resolved or unanimously resolved. It's when you look at cases to get to, you know, a Supreme Court that you find more of these difficult cases because they're difficult. Um, right. Right. And, so, and, you know, that does touch something that's that's very personal to me. Because I have a reputation of being a legal realist, sometimes people confuse that with being a critical legal scholar. And I'm not a critical, I'm not, I'm not a crit from the 1960s. They had an overwrought, 95% of laws or more, I think, are very clear. And we know exactly what they mean. I'm a legal realist when it comes to appellate decision making, you know, hard cases in appellate courts, which is a very small, su I think you'd agree, a very small subset of, 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 of all cases. My discussion with you now twice about statutory interpretation makes me think I'm onto something when I say there is less difference between self-identified textualists and self-identified something else, whatever you want to call them, than is often thought because you do, I think you just said, it is appropriate to look for the purpose and try to figure out the purpose of, of imprecise statutory language, but you, you, you're just more parsimonious where you look, but it's important to look at the right to look for that. Well, I think it, it all ultimately comes from the text. I mean, it may be interpreted against a background. No, I, I think you often you often can reach the same result. I mean, I, I look at some many of our court's cases and um, and you well, the case where I first talked about this a lot, I reached the same result as the majority, but the majority, you know, looked at something where the grammar was off. Right. And said, well, the grammar's off, but, you know, we know the purpose of this statute. And they cited this old case from our court that says, you know, if the literal language would produce an unreasonable result, then, you know, we'll just kind of disregard it and produce a reasonable result. And, <laughs> you know, and I said, I don't I don't agree with that. And actually, let's be more careful. And we, and so I spent, you know, probably three times as much page length as the majority and said, you know, it is a grammatical error, but look at this other part of the statute that would make no sense if you kind of transpose this into that part of the statute, right. and we have a precedent on point, and, you know, there, there are these other reasons. So you can often get to the same place. It's, it's just easier to get there by citing, you know, a committee report and saying that's a result, or right. um, the danger is when, when you do that, you know, you open up the door to doing it in other settings. And, and also, you know, again, to come back to legislative history, if you say legislative history is important or even relevant, then there's an incentive to create legislative history. And there's a huge cost on the system of lawyers and clients have to pay for you to go review all the legislative history because if you don't cite it and it might affect one of the judges, you know, you're not doing your job. Um, so so um, this is great. Um, we have a few minutes left. I want to change gears, if you don't mind, just for a minute. Uh, and, and you're really a, a, a great person to talk about this next issue with. And even though a lot of people don't think it's important, I do. The Georgia Supreme Court live streams its, a, its arguments. Um, in fact, I watched one a couple of weeks ago. I was fascinated by it involving free speech and strip clubs here in Georgia, and I, and I really enjoyed watching it. Uh, and I actually learned some stuff watching it. The Supreme Court is now live streaming its audio, but it is still not live streaming it by camera. I think this generation and the next generation 
are going to want to, although this is a podcast you and I are doing, it's also on YouTube, and a lot of people are going to watch it on YouTube. Um, people want to see, you know, and they want to see body language, and they want to see expressions. Are you happy the Georgia Supreme Court live streams its arguments, and do you want the Supreme Court to live stream its arguments? Well, you know, I came from the federal courts where not only the U.S. Supreme Court, but, you know, trial courts and uh, appellate courts have not right. done video and have been reluctant even to do audio. Um, our Supreme Court was live streaming and and preserved on, on our website all the arguments um, for, I think, about 15 years before I got here. So we've been doing it for <laughs> And most Supreme state Supreme Courts do that, but so do most state trial courts. Right. Um, you know, you can watch TV t tonight and you'll see some big cases going on, you know, and you'll see footage. Um, and there are great advantages to that in, in the sense of transparency and understanding the courts. And I think, you know, there's a lot to be said for seeing how serious the judges take things. Um, there is a danger to that, and I think that's what the U.S. Supreme Court is particularly concerned about. You know, our courts do not operate through their oral arguments. Um, the whole point of judging, and one reason, for example, we don't have, you know, open deliberations and open records of our drafts of opinions like legislatures and executives often do, is courts, you know, come do most of their thought in private and then explain themselves. We are the only branch of government that explains what we do. Um, and we do it in very carefully crafted written opinions. Um, if you televise the oral art, it, and you can't televise the written opinion and nobody, right. I mean, it's a defect in, you know, the media generally covers the written opinions with a very short summary that usually focuses on the result and whether people like the result or not. And it's wrong the, much of the time. Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> yeah, most of, much of the time. Um, um, and because they want visuals, well, oral arguments are not, you know, they're, they're, all, they're not scripted. Um, judges ask questions that are not scripted. We often play devil's advocate because we're trying to figure out the holes in cases. So we say things, you know, that if you put them on TV in a soundbite would sound like you were stating a position that if you wait and read the opinion later, you know, is completely rejected. Um, right. And so there's a real danger there that the oral arguments, because they are the only thing that would be a visual in our visual society um, will become the focus of all of the analysis. And the thing that needs to be studied and understood and focused on, which is the reasoned written opinion, will be uh, largely ignored. Frankly, when they talk about the written opinion, they'll have no other visual. So they would run snippets of the justices talking at oral argument, at least in the background. So, so there is a real danger there. And, you know, our court has balanced it. But then again, we don't get the level of scrutiny that the U.S. Supreme Court gets. Um, I, so would I, say, I, I would say I would say to that objection in the case of the United States Supreme Court, if they tell they do announce their unlike you guys, they do announce the written opinions from the bench. And if that were televised, that would be the final word. And then well, and, what what? What I would say about that is those written announcements are written by the authoring justice and occasionally the dissent. Yeah. They are not, at least when I clerk, they were not circulated in advance to everybody. Um, they occasionally provoke some very unhappy reactions because <laughs> yes. the authoring justice summarizes things in a way that the other justices might not have joined had that been the opinion. That has been let go because um, it doesn't matter, um, you know, that the announcements are, you know, traditionally looked at in court and kind of thought about and then thrown away, but they're not, they're not the opinion. <clears throat> I actually think if, if they were to televise those, there would be a good chance they would eliminate those. Frankly, I don't know any other appellate court in the country that does those opinion announcements. Right. Um, I know at our court, for example, if we, you know, when, when we do written opinion summaries, we are very careful to track the language of the opinions. 
even when when our um, public affairs people try to summarize them, because again, you know, if you're not reading the opinion, so maybe the justice, I think they'll either read the opinions out loud. That could take a long time. A good, <laughs> or there's a good chance they'll get rid of them because, you know, if that becomes the media coverage, <clears throat> the justice who says, well, you left out the footnote that I said I was not joining the opinion unless this footnote were in there. Right. Um, yeah. So you might actually, you might not get that part of it, but you know, it is a balance and the uh, the tape recording, the audio recordings, you know, they didn't want to do that. They've right. kind of done it occasionally. I don't think that's produced the horrible results of, you know, the recordings being taken out of context right. in a really bad way. And so, you know, given another, courts move slowly, given another <laughs> three or four generations. And, <laughs> Just to put a ribbon on this, I think you make some good arguments. I, I think my bottom, <clears throat> excuse me. My bottom line has always been, for the Supreme Court of the United States, their oral arguments are open to the public. They're taxpayer-funded. They are open government meetings. Everything else being equal, C-SPAN is willing to televise them for no cost, for no fee to the government or the taxpayers. I think we are on the side of transparency, but I agree with I agree. you make some good arguments. Last question, and then we'll go. You have to run for re-election. Uh, most state Supreme Court judges have to run for re-election. I don't want to put you in any kind of awkward position, but as a general proposition, I actually have, I used to be totally hostile to the idea of judicial elections. I'm not sure anymore. I'm really not. I, I think it's a way to, to make more democracy in a way. Um, you were saying earlier that if a state Supreme Court issues a constitutional decision based on state law or federal law that people don't like, they can vote them out, which takes you know 51% plus and all kinds of other things. Where do you stand on judicial elections? I mean, from a very practical standpoint, yeah. if you have judicial elections, you're not getting rid of them. Right. Um, I think, I don't know of any state, there may have been one state that that had elections and, and changed, but, um, you know, I think the bottom line is Americans will figure out a way to control the people who purport to govern them <laughs> um, one way or another. and. You know, if you can do it through kind of direct elections of justices or judges, you can do it through um, appointments and then a retention system. Frankly, we have we have pretty much approached the point that we are electing our U.S. Supreme Court justices because, yeah. you know, you the people have realized you can't elect them directly. So, you know, I've got to elect a president and enough senators to get the people I want in there. Um, and when we have U.S. Supreme Court nominations, um, you know, you've got television ads running and fundraising and, you know, it, it's largely a kind of very indirect election mechanism we're moving yeah. toward. I don't know that that's a, a good thing. But, you know, there, there are lots of different systems. I actually think Georgia's appellate system has worked fairly well. Um, most appellate judges, almost everyone on my court except one in the last uh, 40 years, originally was appointed by a governor to fill a vacancy. That process, I think, has real advantages. There's a judicial nominating commission that screens applicants. You get a deep pool of people because uh, the cost of applying and being reviewed by the JNC and being appointed by the governor is a lot easier if you are a very prominent lawyer or a public official who's got a really good job than basically saying, I'm going to give it up and go campaign around the state in an open election where there's no information for <laughs> voters. Um, and so I think you get better pools of people. Uh, appointments tend to be, and studies have shown, to produce more diversity because uh, governors and others, uh, other appointers may take that into account uh, more easily than a statewide election. Um, and, and so that works. And then in Georgia, once you get appointed, you have to run in the next election more than six months away. So you do have the election check on the appointment. Um, and it's nonpartisan, which I think is key. We have a lot of states that have partisan judicial elections, and I'm still trying to figure out, <laughs> you know, that produces a little more information for voters to the extent you think parties reflect judicial philosophies. But um, 
but it's very difficult, especially for incumbent judges, I think, to say, you know, politics is irrelevant to me and then go campaign that evening and say, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican. Um, so I think Georgia has a, a good balance, um, but I'll also, and, and our elections have not been big money. And it is very hard when you see state judicial elections, you know, where they are, they're five or $10 million aside, there's really no way to raise that kind of money in our political system in a nonpartisan way. Right. Um, and so, you know, we've been lucky. Um, I think our system works fairly well. Um, I think it's always at risk of, of people trying to make it more partisan, um, which I don't think would be good for the system. Um, but it does provide a check that isn't there on the federal side, you know, and not just at the appellate level, at the trial court level, you, you get some trial court judges who are tyrannical and short of violating the ethics rules enough to be removed from the bench, um, which is virtually impossible in the federal system, you know, there's no check. Whereas trial court judges who are really, really mean, the local bar can band together and they'll <laughs> find somebody to run against them. Right. Well, I, I <laughs> do know. think we, I, I, um, I think life tenure raises all kinds of issues we don't have to talk about now. Yeah. I, um, before we finish, I just want to say what you, what you said about the Supreme Court and the nomination process, I think was really important and really <coughs> interesting. Um, it's my career ambition to convince people that, and you don't have to respond to this, that the Supreme Court is way too powerful. And one of the evidences of that is that it, it, it's, it plays a major role in our elections. And I would rather see Congress and the president playing the major role in our elections, not the Supreme Court. And I think, you know, that was really a Warren Court beginning. Um, and But frankly, I think the other side has struck down as many laws as the Warren Court did over the years. Um, and, and I wish we would get to a place where the Supreme Court was less important. Readers, of, listeners of this podcast know I feel that way. Maybe deep down somewhere you might feel that way too, but I'm not going to put words in your, in, in your mouth. Um, Thank you very much for doing this. This has been so fun. I really enjoyed it, and I think the listeners will really appreciate your candor, um, and Georgia State always appreciates your help with everything we do. Thank you so much. Well, thanks again for the invitation. I like talking about these issues. I, I'm always amazed by it does seem we agree on a lot more than <laughs> uh, we disagree on, and you know that's a good thing, and it's good to have civil debate about important issues in our society, and lawyers do it well. Um, so appreciate what you do, and, and uh, always glad to help uh, GSU College of Law as well. Thank you, Chief Justice. Really appreciate it. Great. Have a good day. You too.